we are back for our final session of the ACT Network Breakout. And this is our panel session on supporting ACT end users. So let me just, excellent. All right, guys. So we will hear uh, first from Avnish and Penn State, next from Matt and UAB, and, and third from Michelle and Pitt about how they're uniquely supporting their ACT end users Hopefully there's some, some insight that you can gain and, and leverage to support your own local end users. We will hear from them first and then host questions at the end. So within uh, Penn State, we have the College of Medicine here in Hershey. We have a children's hospital, the main hospital and cancer institute. Around uh, $3 billion of uh, revenue annually, so we are uh, expanding actually we have two more hospitals coming up next month itself uh, which means we are accumulating data faster than we can even ingest it within our uh, warehouse so we do have some struggles when it comes to master data management uh, we do have multiple ids and uh, i'll explain how we are tackling that issue going forward Go to the next slide. So in last six to nine months, what we realized, I mean, since we came on board uh, with ACT, I mean, Shrine Network, we also are on TrinetX. So we have three, I2B2, TrinetX, and Shrine uh, Web Client. Uh, we also have PicoNet. So communication has been an issue. Uh, Again, the problem is our institution is spread across Pennsylvania. So the main campus, mostly the informatics is, uh, that's not the capacity we have strongly here in Hershey, that is in main campus state college. Uh, so it was becoming uh, quite difficult. People had many questions, how to grab EHR data, how to use these tools, um, who are the people, uh, how, how do we reach out? So that's what we did. We uh, actually started a kind of road show. Uh, these are the slides uh, which I actually hand over to each uh, chair, vice chair, department head. Uh, whenever I meet, I do some seminars also, go face to face to main campus every week. Uh, so it has been quite an effort last, uh, last year, before COVID-19, I would say before uh, March. Uh, we were reaching out to each department, telling them what services is, not just informatics, but CTSI offers. And uh, since I work for the informatics team, I had my own poster. So that's what I have over here. We have a very simplified procedure. So it's all on red cap. Uh, we uh, ask our users to do, uh, you know, all the data use agreements and everything is online. Uh, so the, these are the links and all the services we provide. Uh, we do mention about Trinetics and ACT also, uh, and then also we, we have a lot of uh, data storage uh, related uh, questions. So that's also we cover. I can move to next, Elena, next slide. So this is, this is a kind of a, was a very uh, difficult process uh, within each campus. People didn't know, okay, we do have, uh, you know, I2B to try and act, what do we do now? Uh, we are able to create queries, how do we grab the data? And as I mentioned earlier, uh, since we are acquiring new hospitals and it is taking time to merge those IDs and we have, uh, we are serving within this area, within Hershey, uh, we are spread now in two geographical areas or maybe two more than two. So our patients are seen in different hospitals uh, and then Avnish has four different IDs. Uh, how do we merge? So that was becoming a big problem. Even when uh, researchers are, were extracting the data, we were seeing duplicate IDs and all that. So uh, we thought, okay, let's at least uh, make this process flow easy. Uh, where IRB comes in the picture. So I have uh, uh, complete uh, you know, data flow happening over here. And at the last you would see, we have a name of Allegra, which is a third party company, uh, third party, which actually validates uh, that a patient 
uh, is uh, you know uh, not deceased and the physical address is also valid uh, because we were seeing all these duplicate ids and all that as and when our master data management system will be up and ready in next one year we won't have uh, these problem so just to simplify how to build the query uh, how to so you know uh, we have two tools i would say i, I consider i to be to as act of course act has a different uh, uh, goal but still pretty much the ui is same so uh, we we uh, we have uh, you know trinetics and i to be to are pretty much similar local queries people are uh, you know um, we we guide them uh, rather than they keep coming back uh, you know for these multiple questions multiple times how do i get my data how do I, where do i need my irb why do i need to validate my data with a third party so we made it uh, simplified and uh, magically actually <laughs> within 3 months all the requests have gone down so we are doing pretty good uh, hopefully next 6 uh, months uh, again pre covid we had much aggressive plan to popularize uh, shine uh, side of the you know uh, client but that did not happen it is all uh, now zoom meetings so pretty much that's that's all i have wonderful thank you very much all right matt on to you thanks lena can you hear me yep great Uh, my name is Matt White. I'm the director of clinical research informatics at UAB. Um, I'm going to speak mostly about supporting I2B2 and a local implementation of ACT at the same time. Um, so why would we even want to do that? I'll talk specifically about the challenges of having these two particular tools offered to the same community. and mostly I'll talk about uh what we do to keep the user experience positive with both of those tools in operation. Okay? So why both? Um there are a number of sites who have discontinued use of ACT or I'm sorry, use of a local I2B2 implementation and just transitioned to using ACT. um if your use of i2b2 is or was similar to that within act this is very natural for uab that would have diminished some of the capabilities we offer to users in a few ways so it necessitates the need for both one is just more data there's a great deal of data that we represent in you in i2b2 that's not available in act uh, we want to allow investigators to query based on as much information as possible. I'm sure we're not alone. Many sites uh, likely have valuable data beyond what we all share in common in act. Second is familiarity of the data. So standardization is good, but sometimes people seem to want to just see the same thing they see in the EHR. They're not as familiar with the standard ontologies and terminologies as we are. They want to see what they know. sometimes it's just verbiage um but sometimes there are in fact real differences in the local data even in when it's mapped to the same standard concept also just rapid uh, addition of content i can't count the number of times i say tell me what you want and we'll put it in tell me what you want we'll put it in Uh, there's a great deal of freedom in that and i like being able to say that because people like the ability to tell me what to do um also we use i2b2 for research generated data and not only uh, ehr generated data our local i2b2 can represent data to the broader community if the irb protocol indicates that it can so sometimes as part of the irb protocol to promote additional secondary research related to that data specifically in our case the Alabama Genomic Health Initiative they specifically want to tell people that that patient population exists they want to promote that uh that data existing to the rest of the community and promote new collaborations probably most importantly as to why we still need to do this is uh the 
um, we allow people to download patient level data, not just counts, HIPAA limited data set data. So self-service access to that data is tremendously valuable and I, we just can't take that away from people. Um, next. So some of the specific challenges, primarily it is just that there are two tools. Um, having two different tools inherently is going to diminish the user experience no matter what. So the two, URL, two URLs, two authentication processes, you have to go to either one of the uh, or the other and it's not really easy to go back and forth. And when you do go back and forth, it even sort of reinforces the fact that there's no connection between the two. You have different query histories, you have different workspaces, et cetera. And it, it almost makes it worse that they look almost the same because people think they look the same, they should do the same things and they just don't necessarily. So that's enough of the problems. I promise I wouldn't focus on why not to, uh, why it doesn't work. But so, uh, go ahead, Elena, to the, to the strategies for making sure that we have a positive user experience. Okay, next. So what do we do? Um, where we can, we make the ontologies look the same. In this example, which is the uh, COVID-19 ontology, uh, we keep the structure that is uh, inherent in ACT, even when we have additional content. In this case, the conditions are the same, the known deceased is the same, but we just sort of drop in the disposition in the middle because that's a piece of meaningful direct documentation that's relevant at UAV. But we put it in the context of the same structure that exists in the act, on the ACT side. Next. So also showing um, even when there is our standard concepts, uh, showing that local content, even when there's a direct mapping to a standard that is in the ACT ontology, there's value in showing that. Um, I mentioned that people want to see what's familiar to them. They want to see what's in the EHR. When there are uh, two things mapped to the same link code, uh, there is still value in seeing those local lab test IDs like the calciums here. Um, those things are meaningful to people. People know why one is used rather than the other. So representing that is valuable. In the diagnoses, we keep our internal IMO and SNOMED codes in the diagnoses and problems, even though they're mapped to ICD-10. In some cases, it's things like a more granular representation of encounter types. Um, those are indicative of particular clinical processes or clinical workflows. Some people won't know what those mean and they're just interested in inpatients, but some people will care very deeply about those and will know exactly what they mean and exactly how to use them. Next. So we also try to update the content at the same time. So obviously you can't always ask the same question. But when you do, you should get the same answer. We don't want the same question asked in ACT and asked in our local I2B2 to get different answers. There are probably a variety of solutions for this, but we accomplished this by just persisting one observation fact uh, structure. So separate downstream uses of that, whether it's our whether it's ACT or Trinetics or even our local I2B2 implementation or other drown downstream uses like uh, registries. They all use views on that same uh, core observation fact schema. When the core scheme is updated, everything is updated. So there's, there's less risk of getting the, a different answer when you, when you ask the same question on different sides. Next. So there are places where we can reasonably prioritize ACT, to specifically prioritize ACT. When we, um, we can intervene anywhere there's already an intent to support multi-institutional trials. There are processes that care about supporting multi-institutional research that are broader than just us data folk. Um, so those are opportunities to specifically target ACT. Um, we can identify places where people already anticipate 
smaller target populations, rare diseases, um, undiagnosed disease programs, things like that, um, where we can benefit from looking more broadly. I wouldn't put this in writing, but sometimes trials have trouble accruing. I'm not saying it happens at UAB, but I've heard that, that is a thing that happens places. Um, that's an opportunity not only to offer a more detailed look at our own data, but also to offer a more detailed look at, um, to broaden that beyond our own patients and to identify additional potential collaborators. Next. So lastly, um, we try to never really talk about I2B2 and ACT as different things. Rather, we talk about them as two parts of our overall infrastructure, supporting all manner of research processes with EHR data. They're just not talked about separately. We have a variety of tools. Which one is best for you depends on who you are and what you're looking to accomplish. We very rarely ever talk about one tool without really describing it in the context of all of our tools and services both self-service and EDLB developer facilitated. Um, so even though they're different things, they're not islands onto themselves. We describe them in the context of a whole suite of, uh, of EHR supporting activities, uh, or let me rephrase that, research related activities that are supported by EHR data. So I see one question in the chat that asks if they're materialized views, no, they are not. Uh, one of our purposes is to not persist more than is necessary. We have to persist most parts of the um, I2B2 and, and Shrine related schemas, but not the observation fact. Um, so I'm, I am happy to take questions after Michelle gives her presentations, unless uh, others want to tell me otherwise. I think that sounds like a plan, Matt. Sounds like okay. a plan, and you will be on the hook very shortly. <laughs> Show my one slide, please. <laughs> Wait, oh, you have two. One slide. Two. One. <laughs> <laughs> it's sunny out. We're going to be getting out of here. Okay. So I went with a very minimalist slide situation here, and I'm going to be talking about a little bit how I support for users of ACT. And I actually, my technique is a little creepy. So I kind of creep around on a series of uh, tables and in the I2B2 to figure out if people are having trouble with their queries and are they getting results? Are they getting errors and not saying anything? Um, and just to get an idea, are they building their queries in an efficient manner? So basically what I've listed here is a little bit of how I do that. Um, one thing I do is I use that Shrine query table from Shrine, and that basically shows all the queries that come across ACT, and you can see all the different sites and everything that come across. And so those, when I look at them, most of them are usually pretty easy. I try to focus in on usually temporal queries or date-based queries, because those seem to be the ones that struggle the most. Um, then the other thing I do is I use my local I2B2, because once a query is executed in Shrine, if you go, if you have the appropriate permissions, if you go into your local I2B2 in your previous query section, you should be able to see all the queries that your I2B2 uh, answered. And so I just drag a few of those over to see if they got results, if the results look re reasonable. I just kind of do like a little random sampling of that to get a feel for how well um, our I2B2 is responding to queries and how well and how complicated the queries are. The other tables that I use are um, QT Query Master, of course, um, because that's where you can see what the actual SQL that is created. 
Um, and also in there, there'll be some indication of whether or not sometimes if, if a query fails, it'll show it in there. And then lastly, I use uh, QT result instance, and those are all in the um, CRC schema. There you'll be able to see if there's been failures on your queries, and then you can kind of try trace it back to figure out who are the people who are having trouble with these queries or that they're not getting results. And then from there, of course, I look them up and if they are having troubles and stuff, I'll send them a little email. Can I help you? Are you having trouble? You know, is there something I can do for you? Sometimes they respond and sometimes they don't. So that's kind of my technique. That's it. I'm done. Questions? Thank you, Michelle. All right, folks, questions for our panelists today. I don't see anything. Matt addressed the one question we had come through. There is a question here in the chat from Mark to Michelle. So what percentage of folks respond to your prompts? Are they appreciative? Good yeah, question. Actually, yeah, I mean, several, like I said, like the one, you know, we use the use case of the cyclical vomiting. That was one of the uh, people that was were having struggles and I kind of said, hey, can I help you out? And so it's about, I'd say about 50-50. Sometimes people don't respond immediately, but then later down the line, when they run into a jam, they feel comfortable sending me an email to say, hey, can you help me out? So it's about 50%, I'd say. Great. And you think they're appreciative for the most part? They don't find it creepy that you did your job as a data steward and were monitoring queries across your local node? I'm thinking 50% think I am creepy. <laughs> but I just have to deal with that, so it's okay. <laughs> All right. So, so Keith wrote, since there are not automated methods to update I2B2 for ACT, how much time, FTE hours, does it take to support your updates? Um, do you mean like when we run our ETL? Keith, I don't know if you can answer. Can you type back? Yes. Uh, okay. So, so my ETL currently takes about 12 hours to run, but I mean, it's mostly handoffs, right? You just kick it off and it just goes. So it's not a lot of FTE hours. I'll say when we add, you know, like when we added the ACT ontology, that takes more time, right? Because you're mapping some different stuff that you hadn't mapped before. Um, and then I think the, the biggest time sink would be things that like labs and meds that we are not at 100% in terms of um, the mapping process. So I do take some time, you know, you know, I don't know, maybe four or five hours a week and try to incrementally try to work through, you know, our mapping to Rx norms or links. So. All right. And we have another, oh, was someone else going to respond to that before we move on? No. Yeah. So yeah, ours runs unattended. Okay. Yeah. UABs as well. I mean, now we're, we're, we're doing lots of data movement, not specifically for the purpose of I2B2 or ACT. So part of it is um, loading large swaths of data incrementally daily from our data warehouse. But those things, uh, I mean, all said and done, we're less than 12 hours between beginning to pull additional ADW content and having updated I2B2 when, um, when we do. And it's more or less unattended other than monitoring. Um, right. Mark wrote a question to say, do I uh, monitor the query topic? I don't monitor query topic as much as I probably should um, because I think I know that, I mean, like for me, like almost all my queries, unless I put data harm, they are, I tend to use the same topic. But I mean, I see that, you know, real researchers do, I guess they're a little more afraid. So they do put in their real topic. Um, but they, I mean, they use, most of them seem reasonable, so. 
we have a question from Brooke Lewandowski to all panelists as well, just as to how much time, so how much staff time um, are you allocating to support your end users when it comes to ACT? So for UAB, we, we have about a half a dozen EDW developers that are um, primarily oriented towards giving people research data and about half a dozen software developers. None of them are specifically there for the purpose of end user support. Um, so it's a little bit of three, four, maybe five people. Um, I, I would say depends on how you define end user support, but in terms of training, uh, interaction with people saying, why did I get this number? Uh, I mean, we're talking probably somewhere between a half or a one FTE just for that kind of interaction. Now that doesn't count implementation. That doesn't count the transition to really uh, pulling full data sets. Anyone else want to Yes, so, yeah, yeah, here in uh, Penn State also, we have like one and a half uh, full-time uh, employees who are dealing with uh, extracting uh, or actually delivering the data, uh, providing support, uh, answering any queries related to quality of data. But as Matt said, uh, when it comes to developers, ETL implementation, that that is separate. Thank you. Anything else you want to add there, Michelle, before we move on? There's a, a follow-up question from Brooke. Um, so, I mean, I am the act person at Pitt. So, and I just do a variety of things. Um, I ETL, I create ontologies, I load ontologies. Um, we have Muller, she'll do some queries. So we're just, uh, it's hard to tell. All right, thank you. So do you panelists have a required training to use Shrine? So there, there oftentimes is a required training to use I2B2 locally. So the question is just wondering uh, if you have a, a university specific training. Yes, uh, this is Avnish, I'll go first. So in uh, our RedCap form, when we onboard a new user, uh, we do require a training which is uh, we're doing uh, multiple sessions like multiple people can join uh, once in a month and I also provide one-to-one uh, -one training so yet yeah, it is a requirement we do not provide uh, uh, account access without your training that has helped us actually because uh, again uh, those who don't come from the medical background they have multiple questions. So having one-to-one -one or a session always help. I'm also planning to have a super user group. Again, that was pre-COVID plan. Now it will be past COVID plan, hopefully in September. So bring uh, these, I, I do have uh, within the campus like five to seven fairly very good research coordinators who are uh, good handling, building queries. They know these tools pretty well and uh, have these uh, group meetings once in a month so that we can help each other. That's it from my side. So for UAB, we don't have required training. Um, we offer I2B2 training every two weeks and that includes I2B2 and ACT uh, training. The bulk of the time is not spent on the logistics of how you drag something from one pane to the other or the concept of Boolean logic that people tend to get that pretty easily. Most of the time is spent going through examples of queries that people actually have direct interest in. And, and much of that time is where would I find this data? Um, how do I need to think about my questions in order to construct a logical question? <laughs> Um, that sort of thing. So we don't we don't require training because we if you meet all the right criteria and have done all the right things, you can log in automatically to I2B2. Um, there is an approval process to to um, 
to get access to ACT, um, but uh, but the re the training specifically is not required. Yeah, and we don't at Pitt we don't have training. We don't require training, and um, we have been working on our training materials, but we haven't finished that yet. Thank you, panelists. There is a, a question from Rob for Matt. What DBMS are your views implemented in, and do you have to perform any special tuning to get the performance you need when using the views? So we are an Oracle, and yes, and yes, and yes, and yes. So there, there have been many iterations of, of indexes and, uh, and, um, and tweaking in Oracle. Um, I have to say the SQL that comes out of I2B2 is not very pretty. Uh, I know that it is the way that it is because it is content agnostic and there's, it's just one of the trade-offs. It's not very efficient. So we do have to, to do a fair amount of tweaking um, to the extent we can. Though, I mean, we're not doing anything magic. It's just basically implementing, uh, implementing indexes where we, we can. Uh, probably the most significant thing is doing um, uh, lots and lots of smaller partitions for observation fact and not just one big table. So yeah. actual database partitions for uh, various domains of data. So we have hundreds of them. Yeah, partitions are your friend. Yep. Another question for you, Matt, from Mark. Can you comment on how you engage with your research community more broadly? I understand you don't often communicate about a single tool, but then what is your hook to funnel researchers into what right. you offer? So we try to take all comers. Um, I stand up quarterly in front of the, the standing research coordinator meetings and say effectively the same 10 minute spiel every quarter. Um, we have data. We would like to give it to you. <laughs> Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Um, we have sort of standard, standing meetings for, uh, for research initiation and support things within the, our CCTS, our CTSA organization. So we try to take as many opportunities to be part of those, um, part of the agenda in those discussions. We try to get in front of trainees and when, when they are getting guidance about their research initiation, we try to get in front of them. To some extent, we go to department and division meetings, though people seem to be really bored because if it's not what they want to do right now, it's not what they want to do right now. We also have gotten, um, we work very closely with our BIRD, our Stats Epidemiology Research Design. So when someone comes with with the intent to ask questions about analysis and biostats, but have questions about data. They, we, we try to be in that forum as well. And even if we're not, the biostats folks know very well to point us to that, point them to us when they're talking about clinical data. And we point requesters to them when they're talking about uh, research design that needs help. Thank you, Matt. What other questions, guys, do you have for our panelists? Other comments or thoughts from our, our panelist team this afternoon? Um, I might just ask, this is Mark, I might just ask one more question of the panelists if, if folks don't mind. I know I'm pushing my luck given the time of day um, at this point, but um, I'm wondering if there are the most common questions or misconceptions you get about ACT. So some of the communication, maybe risks that we need to keep in mind as we communicate about ACT out to sites. Um, any thoughts on that? Or is it maybe just this, the fact that people don't know about it? I mean, so this may be specific 
to us, but probably the biggest risk is if we are, if, if the workflow is not along the lines of, I'm interested in multi-institutional research and therefore I'm querying ACT. If it is rather, I have done queries in I2B2 and I'm transitioning to, uh, to ACT, the risk is that their eligibility criteria, if you can't represent that, you're saying, well, this was your population in, internally. This is your UAB population according to this version of the query. And this is the population at these other sites. So you kind of have to make that translation of, you have this many people at UAB, but the way you can ask the question and act means UAB answers with this population. So you, you have to translate that comparator because if we, if we have an eligibility criteria that either greatly reduces or greatly increases our resulting population internally and we can't express that in ACT, then it looks like we have 400 but other people on the network have 12. Or it looks like we've narrowed it down to a particular population of 10 and it looks like other other sites have four or five hundred, but that is more an artifact of the ability to express the question. Cool. Very good. Thank you. I haven't seen anything else come through in the chat or the Q and A. So we have another couple of seconds here for any last questions for our panelists today. Yes, call. <laughs> <laughs> no one's staring at the clock right now. I'll just, I'll say that again, this is Mark. I'll just say this has really been interesting for me because I don't often get much insight into like this end of the, of the machine here. So hearing about some of how um, the panelists sort of work with their communities, how they might address concerns, um, how they present ACT amongst other tools has been, is really enlightening. I just appreciate uh, their willingness to share this. Great. All right. Well, a big thank you to our three panelists this afternoon. Uh, thank you to Diane and the I2B2 Transport Foundation for hosting us this afternoon. And a, a really big thank you to all of you as ACT sites. I know we all do the work that you put into uh, to ACT into making your node successful. And it, it certainly does not go unnoticed. So we very much appreciate your participation. All right, Diane, over to you to close us out for the day. So oh, I just, um, let's see, we have 91 people still on the line. This is pretty amazing. So um, I just wanted to thank everybody. I particularly want to thank all of our, our panelists and, um, and Thomas and Desiree for, for hanging in there for the last two days, really, you know, working behind the scenes to make sure that things ran smoothly. You know, this was our first uh, major webinar and, um, although, you know, we've got a little fine tuning. I think we did pretty darn good. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy. Um, so and thank you for everyone for, um, for joining us and, um, we will be, uh, putting together a webinar that's focused primarily on the, the European community. So the Europeans who do, um, their work will get together and, and present, um, certainly we'll have U S based, uh, presentations as well. So we'll let you know about that. That'll be coming in the fall. Um, and remember, we have a monthly community call. Um, I think it's the third Tuesday of the month or something like that. It's on our website. So we're always looking for um, uh, topics um, and people to present. So if you have something that you're interested in, um, you know, please let us know and we'll, uh, we'll get you on the docket. Thank you so much.